This begins CD number six. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi Yassir wa A'in Ya Kareem. Waftah bil Haq inna kafatahun Alim. Rabbi Yassir wa A'in Ya Kareem. Waftah bil Haq inna kafatahun Alim. Rabbi Yassir wa A'in Ya Kareem. Waftah bil Haq inna kafatahun Alim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa. وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله سبحانه وتعالى الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله والحمد لله على كل حال we begin with the praises and thanks of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Glorious and majestic is He. Perfect as we learned yesterday in every way. The master of every atom in the universe. The Lord and creator of the heavens and the earth. And everything they contain. So perfect is my Lord. As Dr. Omar explained yesterday. Just to ponder this fact. That his knowledge encompasses not only everything that is, everything that ever was, and everything that will ever be. More marvelous in its way is that his knowledge also encompasses everything that is not, everything that was never, and everything that will never be. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a beautiful, what a beautiful gathering, and what a beautiful subject matter. And inshallah, what a beautiful effect this will have on our hearts. So without further ado, inshallah, I'd like to introduce today's uh, first session, the title of which is Creed as Experience. This session focuses on the divine names and the attribute of divine speech and the correspondence theory of Islamic theology. So keep in mind this idea of a correspondence theory, which is partly, of, uh, partly what will be explained. It illustrates how the divine names are reflected in the universal cosmos and the microcosm of Adamic humanity. It treats the issue of how the one relates to the many and how multiplicity relates to unicity. It also looks at the issue of divine speech and its special relation to the divine essence and what that means about the Quran as a source of ultimate grace, knowledge, and illumination. This last clause is very important because several people wrote in yesterday asking about the uncreated nature of the Quran, uncreated speech, what is the reality of uncreated speech, how does it relate to the essence of God, etc. So this hopefully will be explored partially uh, in this presentation. So, so please uh, keep that in mind. Finally, the questions, can we justify the way of God to man? Why is there evil in the world? Will also be addressed in the, at the conclusion of this session. Again, a lot of people wrote about that as well. How do you explain you know, free will, predetermination, bad things happening in the world? So inshallah, some of those questions will be addressed. Without further ado, Imam Hamza Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. Allahumma la ilma لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصل اللهم على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله in this session I do want to talk about how what we learned yesterday relates to uh, our experience in the world and in relation to the names and uh, how those names reflect in the world. And also I would like to talk about the idea of what the Arabs call ikhtiyar, which is free will or choice. And finally about shar, khair and shar, in the world, good and evil, and how that relates to what in the West is termed theodicy, which is justifying the ways of God to man, and whether or not we can even do that. 
in the Islamic tradition and how I feel uh, that Islam in many ways solves what's known in the West and it's probably the greatest religious problem in the West which is known as the problem of evil in terms of how one can square the existence of in Christianity of a benevolent and an omniscient God with the fact that evil exists in the world and that I think is also the foundation of a lot of the arguments against the existence of at least a personal God or a God that's concerned with human affairs. So beginning with Krita's experience, I mentioned yesterday that religion begins with experience, that the shahada itself, the Arabic word shahada means a witnessing. And we know that the world is divided into two worlds, the created world, the, the entire universe is divided into two worlds, alam al ghaybi wa shahada, the world that is seen and the world that is unseen. Alam al shahada is what we witness, it is the witnessed world, so it is the experienced world. So the, the ghayb is the world that we do not experience and yet we do experience its effects in the alam al shahada. And that's why, in the same way that when we see a tree, if I've never seen the roots of a tree, I could deny those roots existence. And yet if I plant a seed, and I see the tree growing up and coming into the world, I recognize that it needs water, and I put water into the soil. I don't water the tree. So from that, I gain some understanding about the nature of the tree that's emerging into the world, and the, the nature of the soil from which it's coming. So there's a relation to what I see in the world and what I don't see in the world. And the people that begin to discern these meanings are called ulil al-bab, ulil absar. And it's interesting that the word lub in Arabic is seed. It means a pith or a seed or the essence or the gist of something. And lub is the word in Arabic for the mind or for the vehicle of understanding. And so in the seed is an extraordinary metaphor. We come from a seed. But we come from a seed that's nurtured in the soil of a womb. And we don't see it. It's really an unseen experience. I mean now we have extraordinary technology that enables us through mediation to see it. We still don't actually see it. We don't witness it. So don't think when you're looking in a scope at what's going on in the womb that you're seeing what's going on in the womb. No, you're seeing what's going on in the womb through the mediation of lenses and tools which will always have some distortion. So actually what's going on and what we're witnessing is very difficult to have absolute certainty. So when we look out there in the world, there is an idea that everything in the world is testifying or witnessing itself. Everything is in a state of witnessing. And not only that, the world itself is in a state of being witnessed. So you have the seer and the seen both in the world and as a phenomenon that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes is at the essence of the existence of the world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ وَالْحَقِّ أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِي بِرَبِّكَ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ that we will show them our signs, ayat. And a sign, an ayah is an alama. Uh, it is something that indicates something else. That is the nature of a sign. It indicates something else. A sign is a signifier of something else. And what's so interesting about the Qur'an in relation to the modern world is philosophy, the project of philosophy has largely been abandoned except for the area of signs. There is still an immense interest in the philosophical pursuits that are going on in the universities in the West in semiotics and in signs and in language and the nature of language and how language corresponds to reality. So the fact that our tradition is rooted in a linguistic phenomenon before anything else and at the root of the linguistic phenomenon is the phenomenon of signs and what they signify and the fact that what's left 
for human beings to really discuss and attempt to understand is this very thing that we're being told is at the essence of our being, which is language. I mean, it's interesting that the Arabs, in their logic, they did not call uh, the human being the hayawan uh, al-aqil. They called the human being al-hayawan al natiq the speaking animal, which to them meant the rational animal. Mantiq is the science of logic, and so it's reason. But nataqa means to speak. And so at the root of our reasoning powers is language. And there was a recognition of that. And we as human beings are designed to interpret. And the highest form of interpretation that we've been given is the ability to interpret language. And that's why language is such a mysterious event in the world. Where does it come from? How do we obtain it? And how do we have this seemingly infinite capacity to use 28 letters, 30 letters, 42 letters, I mean... All languages basically share less than 50 symbols. And yet within those symbols we have this capacity for seemingly infinite meanings can be generated. Not only that, we recognize that children are able to learn syntactical structures that are understood to be innate because they're able to produce language that they've never heard. And this creates a problem in terms of where language comes from. And that's why you get the LAD theory in linguistics of the language acquisition device, that there's some innate capacity for language that, because obviously prior to this, there was an understanding that everything comes from outside. I mean, this was the empiricist model that comes out of the Enlightenment philosophers, that everything comes outside, that we're a tabula rasa, we're a, a blank slate, and everything comes out uh, from outside. So language is something that we acquire from outside. That becomes very problematic when we begin to understand that language in fact is something that we have an inherent capacity for. And although an aspect of language is necessary from outside of ourselves, which is why if you put a Chinese child into an Anglo-Saxon family in England, that Chinese child will learn English unless those parents are speaking Chinese to it. That if you grow up in an Arabic family, you will develop sounds that for most Western people, they are almost impossible to acquire after a certain age. Letters like Dad and, and Ain. And so you'll find people that grew up here that learn Arabic after their adult onset, and they're unable to speak and use that ain and rain. And I've met many people like that that speak Arabic very fluently, but they're not able to say, uh, they'll say uh, ya'ini instead of ya'ini because they can't get that uh, ain. And I was, when I was a little boy, my, uh, my brother used to listen to Middle Eastern music. He actually liked Um Kulthum and, and uh, he, he listened to a really strange group called The Devil's Anvil, Hard Rock from the Middle East. <laughs> And I remember when I was a little kid, I used to listen to these sounds and my brother and I would actually make jokes about it saying, Habibi, Habibi, you know, and we would do this thing and make these sounds that we heard. And I realized, you know, at a later age, I realized I was acquiring these letters when I was seven, eight years old from listening to these funny uh, Middle Eastern <laughs> And they use all those letters in their, in their especially in like Um Kulthum, she's always using Aini and Habibi and the difficult ones. <laughs> so it's very difficult to acquire, even like Chinese has these tones. If you don't get those as a young child, it's difficult later. But the point is, is that every one of us has a capacity to acquire any of those languages if from an early age we live with those languages. But that is not what's so interesting about language. What is more interesting is syntax. It is how we produce meaning from those sounds. And this comes from, in linguistics, the doubling phenomenon, which we are the only creatures on this planet, as far as we know. I mean, the jinn, we don't have access to studying their linguistics. But as far as all of these creatures out there, 
We have this ability for doubling, and so we're able to make seemingly infinite numbers of meanings with this joining of syllables and doubling uh, sounds together. So we can say, the Arabs say zur, they say zaur, they say zir, and these are all from the same root, but each one has a different meaning. Qawl, qil, qayl. And this is what produces all of these sounds. That's why the monkey, I think, the animal that after us has uh, the largest capacity uh, for language, can only actually has only about 40 or 50 sounds that it can make. And it's only because it cannot double its consonants. That's the only reason. If it had the capacity to do what we can do, then at least aklan or, or theoretically we could envision the possibility of, of uh, again, an extraordinary number of, of uh, sounds. But it can't. So we learn language and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, Ar-Rahman, uh, Allam al-Quran, khalaqa al-insana, Allamahu al-bayan. And so the human being who is created is between two things. Ilm al-Quran wa ilm al-bayan. He resides between these two things that Allah is telling us about our nature. Allama in Arabic is an extraordinary word because it means to imprint. It means to make an impression. Now if you look at the first tools of writing, they were clay. And the way that impressions were made was literally pushing in and making an, an alama or an imprint, like in the Babylonian and these early clay, the, the Assyrian clay tablets. You'll see that they're imprinted into them. Well, that is what alama means. It means to imprint. Language was imprinted in us. Alamahu al-bayan. Language was imprinted in us. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ From amongst his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. وَاخْتِرَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ And the differences in your languages and your complexions. Surely in that is a sign for people who know, for people who have this ilm. Now, in rhetoric, there is, in Arabic rhetoric, there is a concept called tibaq, which is where you use opposites, like layl wa nahar. It's a, it's a very common motif in the Qur'an, to use these opposites, ad-dunya wal akhirah, dhakr wal untha, that Allah uses these and there's always a reason why they're being used. In this verse, Allah tells us from amongst His signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then He tells us, and the difference of your languages and your complexions. What is the relationship between the heavens and the earth, languages and complexions? If you look at the word in Arabic for what Adam was taught, he was taught the asma. And the asma comes from a root word which is samu. Some say it comes from wasama, but they're still related. Samu is what comes from the heavens. And so the sama is the heaven. Language is celestial. Complexions are terrestrial because they come from our mud. So what we're being told here is that the human being is a meeting place between the heavens and the earth. What represents our celestial, celestial nature is our language. And what represents our terrestrial nature is our complexions and our diversity in our appearances. One is inward, one is outward. Language comes from inside and emanates out. Complexions are dhahir. And this is why language is ultimately, it is what determines our humanity, not our complexions, because complexions do not go from in out. They don't have the same capacity. The language is a much deeper uh, reality in our human essence. And that is why we are hayawan natiq. That is, if you want to get the definition of a human being, it is the human, the speaking animal. That is at the root of it. 
And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us these signs in ourself and on our horizon. And He's telling us that isn't it enough that your Lord is witnessing all of this. So just as you are witnessing the world, the alam al-shahada, your world is being witnessed. And without that witnessing, it disappears. In other words, it doesn't exist. And so if you look, and this is the out of sight, out of mind, that things have reality for you as a subjective human being when you are perceiving them. When they are no longer in your perception, either your literal perception of, of witnessing or hearing or your intellectual perception through thinking about them. If either of those are gone, then that thing for your subjective reality is gone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these tools, made us creatures that interpret the world. We are interpreters of the world. And then has given us signs in order for us to understand something very important. And that is that all of this is indicating one truth. All of this. Everything that you are seeing is indicating one truth. And that is that behind all of this, not in any literal way, behind all of this, at the root of existence, is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is its creator and sustainer at the root of all of this. And that is why those who look only at the tree and can't even comprehend the existence of the root structure only know half of the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَةِ dunya." They know the outward of the world. وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ غَافِلُونَ But they are heedless about the other half. So their knowledge is not sufficient knowledge because they only have half of even the created reality. We haven't even gotten into uh, what is behind it, which is the creator. But from that perspective, they only see and believe in what they see. So in terms of creed and in terms of making this real for ourselves, one of the most important things is to have access to the names because we believe that the names are manifesting themselves in the world. And in that way, the world is a mirror of the divine attributes. What that means is, when the mystery of the mirror is when you look into the mirror, it is a reflection that needs light. If there's no light, you can't see the reflection. And that is why the same is true with the eye. When you look into the world to see the mirror of the divine attributes, you need light. And that light is called basira. It's the inner sight that enables people to penetrate what is beyond this and see what is being reflected to them. And that is these divine attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself with. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he is those seven attributes that he is al hay that he is al murid that he is the basir the seer the mutakallam that he is the sami' when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes all of these qualities that he has described himself with what he is also telling us wa fi anfusikum afaratubsirun in your own selves don't you see these signs don't you see that your speech is a tajalli of the mutakallim? That your sight is a manifestation of the basir? That your hearing is a manifestation of the sami' That your willing, your volition is a manifestation of the murid? All of these attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself with. And that's why the names are divided into the names that are mushtaraka and the names that are ghayr mushtaraka. There are names that we have no ishtiraq with Allah in those names. And it's prohibited to name children those names. But there are other names that we do have, we share, not in a shirk way, even though that word is used, ishtiraq. What it means is that it is a majaz, and a majaz is it's a metaphor, it's not literal, because what we have is contingent, and what Allah has is absolute. And so it is an approximation of the meanings. And this is why the Prophet was called Ra'ufun Rahim. Those are two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he used to describe his Lord. Ismail salam was described as Halim. That is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet was described as Al-Kareem, 
That's one of his names. It is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the names that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself with, he has also revealed them to us in the creation. So while a person can be Rahim, he cannot be Rahman. We cannot call somebody Rahman. Both are from Rahma. But Rahman is an aspect of the Rahma that human beings do not have. Because even though they both have Mubalagha in them, which is hyperbolic uh, meaning, nonetheless, Rahman is an attribute that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to Himself alone. Ra'uf is the same thing, Ra'fa, which is a type of compassion. So one of the greatest ways of making this creed become real is to begin to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes and actions in the world. And this is very difficult because the first stage of it is an understanding. This is right thinking. It's changing the way we perceive the world. And it's actually, it's effort. This is mujahada. Obviously, the desired stage is to move beyond right thinking and to enter into an experiential state which is called mushahada. And this is actually where it is a true witnessing. It's not a testifying. We can testify to that truth. We can testify to the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qahirun fuqa ibadihi. But to actually see that in the world is, is something that becomes very difficult. And this is mujahada. And obviously one of the most powerful means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us for that is tadabbur and tafakkur. And the reason why tafakkur is so exalted in Islam to the point that we have hadith indicating that a moment's reflection is greater than 60 years of devotional practice. Because you were created to worship with understanding. There is a hadith and even though there's some, the chain has some problems, it's understood to be a sound hadith in its meaning, which is لَيْسَ لِلْمَرْءِ مِنْ صَرَاتِهِ إِلَّا مَا عَقَلْ That a man does not have anything of his devotional practice except what he is consciously aware of. And this is one of the reasons why we do nawafil. Nawafil is meant to redress the shortcomings of our devotional practice. That is what the point of nawafil is. One, it's a sign of extra devotion and extra love, but it's also, uh, from a more practical perspective, it is to redress the shortcomings of the prayer. And this is why our ulama say that because heedlessness is the overwhelming state of the majority of humankind, that at least a moment's presence in the prayer is necessary for the prayer to be valid. There has to be lahza min al khushu'a. And in the books of prayer, in the books of fiqh, they remind people to attempt that at least at the beginning of the prayer. Because they're in a more conscious state. But there are people that literally can go through the prayer in a completely somnambulant state. And I really believe that it is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we actually remember the number of rakats. I mean, I think that is... أَقَامَ ibad fima arat. I mean that in itself to me is a sign of God. The fact that we can be in this somnambulant state and yet be able to perform at least outwardly. And the Arabs differentiate between the ashbah and the arwah. The outward form and the inward reality of the human being. And this is why Ibn Atayullah he said الْعَمَالُ صُوَرٌ قَائِمَةٌ That actions are forms. And then he said, فِيهَا And the, this animating force of the forms is the secret of ikhlas, of sincerity in the actions. This is what brings the action to life. It makes it meaningful. And one of the poets said, إِنَّمَا الْكَوْنُ مَعَانِي قَائِمَةٌ بِالصُّوَرِ That the cosmos is actually meaning set up in images. Whoever understands this is among the people of discernment. That if you miss this experience of the world, that the world is ibra, is an abara 
Abra is an amazing word because it relates also to ta'bir, to speaking, to meaning, to significance. So ibra is what is signified, but it also means to move across because again, meanings are metaphors. All of language in reality is metaphorical in that it is a abara. Metaphor means to jump over something and that is what abara means. A ma'bara is a bridge and that is what language does. So the world is like that itself. It's to take you, it's a bridge to take you to a much higher understanding of what you're experiencing. And that is, that is what Sayyidina Isa told one of his disciples in an Islamic hadith that never allow a breath to come out without an ibra, without some understanding, some meaning. And it's everywhere. Sayyidina Isa was walking by and there was a dead carcass and his hawariyun, the disciples said, ma antenna, you know, how foul and fetid it is. And he said, wa ma abyada asnana, and how white its teeth are. He was taking another ibra. He was seeing the beauty in the, the, the ugliness. وَمَا أَبْيَضَ asnana, And that, you can go on and on about just the meanings of that statement in relation to the dead carcass. You can go on and on just about that. That is ibra. That is taking meaning. And that is ultimately what we were sent here to do. I would like to, to move now to the, the idea of ikhtiyar. And this is one of my favorite words in the Arabic language. And the Arabic language, every once in a while I get these glimpses of this vast ocean that the Arabic language is. Robert Frost has a poem about people that sit and look out at the ocean on the shore. And he says that what's behind them is land which is so much more varied and from that point of view should be more interesting. And yet, we don't look at the land behind us, we look out at this ocean. And what in essence we're doing is we're recognizing there's so much we don't know. There's so much hidden and inaccessible to us. And that to me is the, the nature of this language. The Arabs call their dictionaries the qamus and muhiyat, the engulfing ocean. And those words are فَهَلْ سَأَلُوا الْغَوَّاسَ عَنْ صَدَفَاتِهَا Did they ask one of the poets said about he, as if he was the Arabic language, You know, I'm a hidden pearl in the midst of this ocean. Have you asked the divers about all these jewels that I have in me? In other words, the people that غَاصَ that they, they dived into this ocean of the Arabic language. If we look at the word in Arabic for free will, it's a beautiful word because it comes, the root word is khayara, khara yakhiru, which means to choose or to prefer. But the masdar is khayr, which means good. And what that indicates is that the only thing that you can choose is good. That, that is in essence what free will is. That your bad actions are not free will. You don't choose to do bad. What you do is you capitulate the gift of free will. And that is why sin is such a wretched thing. Because you are, in, a, in essence, you are throwing this gift back to the one who gave it to you. And it's such an affront to the waqar to the dignity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is owed. That is at essence what free will is in Islam. It is to choose the good. And that is mujahada. One of the things about struggle in the world which is so fascinating is to master anything is a very arduous process. But the fruit of mastery is the most joyful thing that we have been provided with in the world. The fruits of mastery. That those people who never master anything, and one of the poets said, مَا رَأَيْتُ عَيْبٍ مِنْ عَيُوبَ النَّاسِ كَنَقْصِ الْقَادِرِينَ عَلَى الْكَمَارِ I never saw a fault among people's faults as bad as the inability 
of one to achieve perfection who doesn't do so. He couldn't imagine a fault greater than, or a deficiency or a blemish, greater than one who has the ability to achieve kamal, human perfection, and yet doesn't do so. And one of the beauties of our Islamic tradition is the pursuit of something is the fulfillment of that thing. The Prophet ﷺ told us, Niyat al-Mu'min ablaghu min amalihi. The intention of a believer will take him further than his actions. And we are told in the Athar that people who set out to memorize the Qur'an will have that teaching completed for them in their grave if they don't finish it before they die. People that set out to learn knowledge will have that completed by the angels for them. And so the pursuit of perfection is perfection itself. This is at the essence of what we have been given. Because we are all falling short of the glory of God. That is our nature. And there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us like that. And that's why the Arabs say, Al-Kamalu Lillah. Perfection in reality belongs only to God. But even human perfection is Lillah. Because you cannot perfect yourself unless it was for God. Al-Kamalu Lillah. That even your human perfection must in reality be for the sake of God. Because if you do anything other than the, for the sake of God, then it is not perfection. It is quite the opposite. It is not only imperfection, it is, the, it is a blemish on your soul. Now the word in Arabic for doing right is asaba. That's one of the words. Asabta sawaba. You did right. Well, what that word means is to strike the arrow. The Arabs say asabta marma. You hit the bullseye. Meaning that you got it right. The word for sin in Arabic is akhta'a. Which means to miss the mark. In Old English, the word for sin means to miss the mark. So this was an understanding that what we are meant to be doing is aiming for the good. And that is what choice is. And if you fall short, if you transgress, if you go to the right or to the left, that the way you rectify that is toba, To go back, to reset your aim and to start again. Redress your wrong. I read this this famous basketball player who always got his shots usually they asked him what do you think about when you miss a shot and he said too far too short too much to the right too much to the left that's what he thought and that is how you should be living your life I should be living my life in any action we do was it too far too short too much to the right too much to the left why didn't I hit the mark And Imam al-Bukhari, one of the reasons why Ramaya is to be taught to children is because there's a great secret in archery. Imam al-Bukhari was a master archer. One of his companions said, I spent 20 years with this man and he shot arrows every morning. And I never saw him miss the bullseye except one time. Now there is a relationship to Imam al-Bukhari's martial arts and to his hadith science. Because he was not only a master of hitting the mark with an arrow, but he was a master of hitting the mark in the hadith. And that's why his ma'akhta'a fil hadith. He didn't make those mistakes in the hadith. That's why his book is Asahu Kitab Ba'da Kitab Illah. But there's a relationship to his practice, that spiritual practice of martial arts. And when the Prophet ﷺ, when it said, A'iddu mastata'atu min quwa, the Prophet said in the hadith, Ala wahi rimaya Ala wahi rimaya Ala wahi rimaya That power is in archery. Power is in archery. Power is in archery. Now, interesting. A story, Sayyidina Omar once saw a group of tabi'een, they were practicing archery in Medina. And they used to practice between Asr and Maghrib. One of them, he said to him, he said, Akhta'ta, uh, you, you missed the mark. And he said, Nahnu mubtadi'een. Ya Amir al Mu'minin. We're beginners. But he made a grammatical mistake because Nahnu is the Mubtada. Mubtadi is the Khabr. It should have been Marfu'a. So he should have said Nahnu Mubtadi'un. He said Nahnu Mubtadi'een. We're beginners. He said, Wallahi, inna khata'ak fi lahnik 
اشد عليه من خطئك في الرماي your mistake and your grammar is harder on me than you're missing the mark with that arrow so he was indicating a relationship between one's practice in the world and and also one's internal what's coming out of oneself and what one is doing there's a relationship between the inside and the outside So this idea of free will, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us and given us this ability to act in the world. We have this ability. We, on the other hand, believe because of very deep philosophical deliberations by our ulama, not only on the Qur'an, but on the implications of any other position. We also believe that our actions are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not create our actions. The position of the Mu'tazira was that we create our actions. And the reason they did that was because obviously they had a belief about a salah wal aslah that it was an obligation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what was good for His creation. And so this brought in the problem of theodicy of, of how evil fits in the world. And if we say that God creates our actions, then our evil actions become creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, how do we square our understanding of a benevolent Lord with the creation of evil? This becomes a problem. So I'm going to get to that, but before I do that, I want to talk about how the free will is resolved because it's related to the problem of evil in a very profound and deep way. The free will was understood to be acquisitional. And this is what uh, our scholars called kisp, which is لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ وَعَلَيْهَا مَكْتَسَبَتْ لَهَا means it is for it what it earns and it is against it what it has wrought. From wrong actions. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states that we earned something. وَمَا أَصَابَكَ مِنْ حَسَنَةً فَمِنَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَصَابَكَ مِنْ سَيِّيَةً فَمِنْ نَفْسِكَ Whatever afflicts you from good is from Allah, and whatever afflicts you from wrong is from your own self. In other words, what you earned. Now the word in, in Arabic for calamity is what? Musiba. إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ What does musiba mean? To hit the mark. It's a calamity that hits the bullseye. It's not called a makhta'a. A musiba is what hit the mark. It reached the proper target. And that's why you cannot be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Poor guy, he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in the right place at the right time, but the question for us is, was he in the right state and the right mind? That's the question. Because the readiness is all. It's not whether death is coming or not. Death is coming, and, and that is an inevitability, but it's whether we are prepared for what is coming or not. So what afflicts us is destined to afflict us, and it cannot miss us. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, what was decreed to hit you cannot miss the mark even if the whole world tried to prevent it and what was decreed to miss you cannot hit the mark even if the whole world tried to make that happen it's as simple as that so in this position that the Mu'tazida took they used certain verses and there, there was a debate early on between a, two groups called the Qadriya and the Jabariya the Qadriya are the people of the Mu'tazilite who viewed that what happens in the world is human doing. That human beings create what they do. The Jabariya position was the human being was completely determined. That he had no ability to do anything. One group took the verse, وَمَا رَمَيْتْ إِذْ رَمَيْتْ وَرَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَىٰ That you didn't throw when you threw, but Allah threw. The other one took the verse, لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ وَعَلَيْهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ أهل السنة والجماعة took both. And one of the things that Ibn Taymiyyah رحمه الله says is that every innovative group has proved their innovations by the book and the sunnah. But they do so always by taking certain verses and neglecting other verses. And Allah asks the question, أَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضَ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you believe in some of the book and reject other parts of the book? That's always what the people of innovation do. So how do we then square the fact that everything is decreed 
the Agile, all of these things. These are long theological debates about aforeknowledge, that God knows things before they happen, and how do you accept the idea of free will if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows them before they happen, and basically how the Muslim scholars understood this was two things. One, that human beings are musayyar in large aspects of their life. In other words, there is a determination. We are determined in physical space. We are determined in the limitations that we've been given from our birth. We know now that genetics determines many things. Not all things. I mean, we're moving to a a synthesis of the nature-nurture debate because these are two debates in now in biology but traditionally in psychology and and in philosophy of whether people are more affected by their surroundings or by their nature, the human nature. So we have human nature that Allah has given us. There are three natures within the human being. There are three powers. What is called the quwwa al-ghadabiyya, or the quwwa al-aqliyya, the rational power. The quwwa al-ghadabiyya, the irascible power, or the emotional power. And the quwwa al-shahwaniyya, the appetitive power. These are the three powers. Now this is a traditional schema that you find in many traditions, but you certainly find it in the Islamic tradition. It corresponds with modern neurological research to an extraordinary degree. We now recognize that our brain is triune. It's divided into three types of brain. We have the neocortex, which is the rational brain. We have the midbrain, which is the emotional brain. And then we have the R stem, or the reptilian brain, which is the brain of appetites. And each one of these has an, an important function. And it's not for nothing that the appetitive is the base of the brain. The emotions are in the center of the brain, but the highest is the rational brain, the neocortex. Now, the way that we were designed and commanded by our Lord was to live in harmony with these three spheres within us. We were designed to live in harmony with them. But Allah has given us the aql And the word in Arabic, aqala, means to constrain. Another word in Arabic for the intellect is tamur, the commander. Another word in the Arabic uh, language for intellect is nuha, which is from naha, to forbid, to prohibit. So the rational mind is the prohibitive, the constraining aspect of the human being. It is meant to rein in. And iqal is a hobbling cord. It is meant to rein in the midbrain, the quwwa al-ghadabiyya, and the quwwa al-aqliyya, uh, the quwwa al-shahwaniyya, these two lower brains, to hold them in constraint, but to use them as vehicles, in the same way that a wild horse is of no benefit to the rider, but a horse that is saddled and bridled, and fed only what it needs, so that it doesn't grow fat, and become useless. That is the nature of these two lower aspects of the human being. If they are bridled, and controlled, they serve us. If they become unbridled, without restraint, they lord over us, and they take us, inna al-hawama tawalla yusmi aw yasimi, like Imam al Sidi says. When passion takes control, it either destroys or defiles. Now the Quran sums up these three in an extraordinary verse. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. Those who do not call upon Allah another God. This is the worst thing that you can do with your rational mind. There's no higher wrong than to misunderstand your Lord. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ And they do not kill another soul that Allah has sanctified except with just right from Allah. The worst thing that your irascible soul or your قوة الغضبية can do is to kill a human being out of anger. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ and they do not fornicate. The worst thing that your appetitive soul can do is fahisha, is sexual foulness. 
So these people that Allah is describing are people who never allow their rational soul to go astray, their irascible soul to go astray, or their appetitive soul to go astray. And this is ikhtiyar. This is where choosing the good comes in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us always two choices in the Qur'an. The hasan and the ahsan. The good and the better. And He gave us a Prophet وسلم, who always chose the better. Always. And the one time that he chose the Hassan over the Ahsan, he was rebuked in the Quran. Abasa wa tawalla. The only time he chose the Hassan over the Ahsan, he was rebuked in the Quran and reminded that for him to choose a virtue in neglect of a greater virtue is the worst thing that you can do. Habibullah. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you permission to, if you want to, to have retribution, an nafsu bin nafs, wal'aynu bin ayn, if you want that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, وَإِذَا أَصَابُهُمْ الْبَغْيُ وَالَّذِينَ أَصَابُهُمْ الْبَغْيُ هُمْ يَنْتَصِرُونَ When oppression afflicts them, they defend themselves, protect themselves. But then, وَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَى but those who forgive, those who redress, reconcile, their reward is with Allah. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said on the Yawm Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yunadi, Aina ladina lahum ajrullah. Where are those who have the reward of Allah? And only those who afa wa aslaha can answer that call. Only those who forgave and pardoned and didn't demand their redress of their wrong. And that's why for the personal soul, the high path is to forgive. But for other people, the high path is to want their wrongs redressed. But for your personal soul, the high path is to forgive. That is why the Prophet ﷺ always forgave for himself. But for others, he demanded the redressing of wrongs. When hakamta fahkum adri, if you judge between people, judge with adl. He didn't say forgive them and reconcile because his haq is not involved. Now he has two people who have brought their complaints to him and he's commanded to judge and in that case he does not judge by pardoning. He judges by justice. And this is one of the things that many Muslims don't know about the Sharia is unfortunately is that this idea of hudud there is shafa'a in hudud as long as it hasn't reached the, the so sovereign state. If somebody steals from you his father can come and pay you money or ask you to not take it to the court so that his hands not severed. I mean, the sharia is merciful. Even people don't realize that adultery, fornication, these things are best veiled. I mean, if somebody's daughter, la qadr Allah, if that happens to them, like this society, they used to, women used to disappear in college or high school. They'd say, oh, she's visiting her aunt, which happened to be a nine-month visit. And then when she got back, she had a new sister. And that's the way people did that. Because there was a recognition of blame and a recognition that these things are wrong and they destroy society. Well, the same is true within the Islamic ethos. That people wanted to veil other people. This idea of taking people and... It's, it, it's really alien to the spirit. But once it gets to the sovereign state, then the state has no, author, has no other choice but to implement a had. No other choice. Basically, evil. And, uh, you know, the proof about actions being created. He created you and what you do. And what that means, and just to explain that so people understand a little better. What that means is, if I pick up this, I did that volitionally. In other words, I willed something. Now, obviously, there's new arguments emerging because we have determinists. There's a lot of determinists in this culture, uh, in the scientific field that are now trying to argue about neurological impulses for volitional acts that occur before the actual will to do something. But that does not negate the Islamic understanding because it's only if you don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that problematic. If you understand that Allah exists, it actually makes perfect sense that you would have neurological reactions 
uh, even before you willed because that's part of the provision that you need in order to fulfill what you're willing. So that still does not change our understanding of this. The kisp, the acquisition is done that I moved to do this. Now, in my mind, I wanted to demonstrate something to you which is my volition to lift this up. Everything that happened in that process was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, all of the strength, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, all of the strength was given to me to do that by Allah. That everything, all of the atoms, all of the movement, all of the space, all of this is a constant creational activity of our Lord and therefore He is facilitating this. Now where this becomes a problem is in evil. Because if somebody lifts their hand to kill an innocent person or a child, then there's some problems with that. And within this, the Western tradition, the argument goes that if God is all loving or benevolent and God is uh, omnipotent, all powerful, and there is suffering in the world or evil, then two problems arise. If he was all good or benevolent, and yet he wasn't all powerful, then that's why he couldn't stop the evil. But if he was omnipotent and all good, then he could stop the evil because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would obviously see and know that a crime or some evil was going to happen. And if he didn't stop it, well, if I was a person who was about to witness a child being killed and I had the power to stop it and I didn't stop it, I would be called evil in my complicity. And in Islamic law, you are criminally liable for ta'zir. Because we have what's known as haq al-is'af or haq al-nusra, which is the right the people have to be protected by those who are witnessing their oppression if they're able to prevent it. That's a human right in Islam. So how then, because the, the people that argue against a merciful God and an omnipotent God say that, I'm sorry, I cannot believe that a God that would allow all this suffering in the world uh, that he is, he is all good. Now, for us, there, tr the traditional response to this is la yusaru amma yafa'an wa hum yusalun. That's the traditional response. And that is directly from the Quran. He is not asked about what he does, but you will be asked about what you do. And that for a, a believer I think is adequate. That's the Jewish response. The Jews and the Muslims share uh, a creedal aspect of our religion that, that the Christians do not share with us. And that is that we do not have a problem with evil. The Christians have a problem with it because they do believe that God is all good, benevolent, loving God and they do believe he's omnipotent and therefore they struggle with evil and they've, there are many, many arguments for it like Augustine has the uh, that evil is the absence of good in other words, evil doesn't exist it's, it's, it's only that the good is absent so he sees evil as a vacuum that is an interesting argument and, and it's similar to a, an Islamic understanding in that sharr in the Arabic language is not evil per se. Sharr is also want or deprivation. So we call poverty sharr and we call wealth khair. I mean that, that's in the Arabic language. So you can say about somebody, asabuhu sharr and you don't mean evil afflicted him, you just mean deprivation. And you could say, أَصَابُهُ خَيَرْ And you don't mean good afflicted him, you mean wealth. It could be evil for him, it could be bad for him. So for instance, the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى حُبْرِ خَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ He loves good. That ayah does not mean good, it means he loves wealth. But Allah uses the word khair 
to mean wealth. Why? Because chara yichiru means to choose or to prefer, and human beings prefer wealth over poverty, and they're right to do so because wealth is an attribute of God, and poverty is an attribute of the servant. So to choose what is God's attribute over what is, what is humiliation and servitude is obviously a divine choice. So you are choosing good. There is ikhtiyar in that. So when, when you, that's his answer. There's another, uh, Irenaeus was a bishop, uh, a Christian bishop early, who had the idea that there was a divine wisdom in evil. And we share this also in that it is through evil that the soul is improved. Now from our perspective we would not call that evil because anything that appro- uh, improves us is khayr. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in, in a hadith that Suhaib al-Rumi relates in Sahih Muslim, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرَ الْمُؤْمَنِ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ لَهُ كُلُّهُ خَيْرٌ Because his affair is all khayr. And that's why you will often, what he said, ذَلِكَ لِي أَحَدًا سِوَى الْمُؤْمَنِ And that is only the mu'min's right. That's only for the believer. And that's why good that afflicts somebody in a state of ingratitude is bad. So that hadith indicates that the Prophet ﷺ, and that's why it indicates that the Prophet ﷺ was telling us that what you perceive as sharr is khayr when you're a mu'min. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is why I, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second, but this is why I like the, uh, the boohoo and the, and the rah-rah theory. Uh, because I think there's a lot of truth in that. Is that what people deem good and what people deem evil is, is usually what their likes and, and dislikes relate to. And that's why one of the things, the ways of getting out of emotional thinking and into rational thinking is to look at what's good in what you deem bad. To look at what is good in what you deem bad. That is one of the ways of freeing yourself from this type of thought that, that constrains or, or delimits your ability to perceive good in the world. So for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُتِبْ عَلَيْكُمْ الْقِتَالِ وَهُوَ كُرْهُ لَكُمْ Fighting has been prescribed for you. And qital means martial fighting, but it also means struggle, according to Ibn Mandhur and Lisan al-Arab. But here, obviously the dominant meaning and the first and foremost meaning, it is incumbent upon you if you're able to defend yourself against aggression or transgression or defend others who are being oppressed uh, or transgressed upon. Allah has deemed that. We are not pacifists. We actually believe in the right of self-defense and Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said that there are only two justifications in the Quran for fighting. Those who persecute you religiously and those who drive you from your homes or threaten your land or your well-being. Those are the only two reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in the Quran. And Allah loves not the transgressors. And Allah la yuhib al-mu'tadeen. وَلَا إِلَّا عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ There's no oppression, uh, there's no transgression except against transgressors. And that's not real udwan because the Arabs say al jazam min jins al-amal. The requite of something is in the nature of that thing being requited. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, جَزَاءُ سَيَّةٌ سَيَّةٌ مِثْرُهَا The reward of a wrong is a wrong like it. Well, that doesn't mean a wrong like it. It means that it's redressing the wrong and it's a sayya in that the person that's getting his wrong redressed doesn't like it. The evil is sh- that fighting is kurhun lakum. Kurh means detestable to you. And that's why people that love to fight are pathologically unwell. They're sick people. And there are people like that. They buy magazines called, what's that, Soldier of Fortune. And if you look in the back of that magazine, it's got all these really weird things that you can buy to learn how to maim and kill better. And this is a disease. People are not well. They're not well. You should not desire to kill people. And human beings are actually designed not to like that. And and if you do like it, it's pathological. You've deviated from a, a state of health. And that can be redressed. And it should be. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih al-Bukhari said, لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو Don't desire to meet your enemy. 
What I can is said Allah al-afiyah, but ask Allah for well-being and peace and security. But if, if you're forced to meet them, be brave, be courageous. Allah says after that, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ And maybe you hate a thing and in it is much good for you. And there's another verse similar to that relating to husbands and wives having marital problems. That maybe you dislike a thing and Allah puts in it much good. And the ulama differ about that. Some say reward for being patient with difficult character. Some people say a child that comes out of the marriage because sometimes when children come the relationship changes because it's a much deeper relationship. There are many verses but sometimes you dislike a thing and in it is much good for you and sometimes you love a thing. And maybe you love a thing and it is wrong or evil for you and Allah knows you don't know. You don't know what's good or what's bad for you. That is in essence, I think, how Muslims have understood tribulations, calamities in the world is that we don't know what is good for us. Now, obviously, another aspect of this is, and, and there are many reasons for this, and I want to just go through a few because I think this is very helpful. The Arabs have a proverb that says, By its opposites, things are understood or known. And if there was no opposite to khayr, there would be no understanding of khayr. We would not understand it. And that's why the world is opposites in that we can understand it. One of the things about evil in the world for the Muslims is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost has informed us that he created the world a, a belwa, a test. And he said in the Quran, إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ هُوَ الَّذِي خَرَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ He created death and life. And it's interesting that he mentions death before life in that because that is an ibtila in and of itself. It's also the purpose of this world is that it terminates and the purpose of death is that there's new life. And this is why one of the Persian poets said, you came into the world crying and everybody around you was weeping. And you leave the world laughing and everyone around you is crying. Because once you move to the next world, it's like somebody who was, you know these Indian trains where they have like the people riding up on the top in the wind and everything. And then they're offered to come up to first class. I mean, how many of them would say, no, 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 I'm fine here. <laughs> really enjoying the weather. <laughs> in essence is what moving from this world to the next world is infinitely greater than moving from economy class to first class for a believer. It's not something that you would turn down. And this is why, you know, Hamlet's famous soliloquy is that he's, he's asking about what happens after death and because he doesn't know, he's saying, you know, we patiently bear the tribulations of the world because we don't really know what's coming and it might be worse. By the end of that play, when his friend Horatio asks him, um, you know, I'm worried about you in this fight. Do you want me to cancel the tournament? He says, if death's coming to you, you can't avoid it. If it's not coming, you can't make it come. And then he says, the readiness is all. And so he's already, by the end of that play, he's in a state of submission. And this is the nature of the world, is to get you to that state where you are ready. And that's why there's something very uh, redeeming about all the tribulations of Hamlet because by the end of the play, in essence, from a sacred perspective of looking at that play, he is not a tragic figure, but in fact is redeemed. So this is from a small essay that Iz ibn Abd al-Salam, one of our great Sultan al-Ulama, the prince of all the scholars, he wrote this and it's called The Benefits of Calamities. He says that there are many benefits for calamities and depending on the rank of the person they are different. He says the first benefit is ma'rifat al-rububiyya wa qahriha is to know lordship and its overpowering effect on your life. In other words that Allah is Lord. 
I mean, that is a benefit in calamities. Because if everything went your way, you'd start thinking that you were the Lord. And that's why lords, people that are wealthy, often go into that state where they think they're lords. And they used to call them lords, the house of lords. So when, when everything, when you get your way, you begin to think that I'm in control here. And this is what, you know, in this culture, they have these people that are called control freaks. They do everything to stop anything from happening that can upset their little plans. And little plans, I say, because any human plan is a little plan in relation to the big plan. But see, people really have this thing of, no, I'm in charge here. I did it my way. That's one of people's favorite songs in this culture. I did it my way. You know, it's like boasting about my freedom. This session continues on the following CD.